The whole thing it unwinds. Behold the great deception. Traversing throughout time.
what you're seeing here is a mirage. You typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. We talked about this last night. Conditions are right on the lake that we're actually seeing a mirage of the Chicago skyline. A mirage. A mirage. How's my audio, folks? Can you hear me all right? Got a lot of stuff lined up for you today, but I don't have a um, an outline like I often do, so I'm just gonna fly by the seat of my pants here, and uh, we'll see how how it goes. All right. So, welcome. Uh, we'll just start with a, another little fun, fun tidbit that has to do with dating, and uh, this is from Kent Hovind. He's um, he's been bashing the mainstream geological model for decades, and uh, we don't exactly agree on everything cosmological, but he's got a lot of very interesting stuff to say. So we'll just. Uh, Play a little bit of this while people are still rolling in. Ideally with sound. Fifty three, Willard Libby invented it at University of Chicago, got a Nobel Prize for it, and then moved to Stanford. I'll just start it over. Seven to 53, Willard Libby invented it at University of Chicago, got a Nobel Prize for it, and then moved to Stanford. In 1949, the lower leg of a mammoth, carbon dated 15,000 years old, but the skin was 21,000 from the same animal. Talk about a slow birth. <laughs> 1963, living mollusk shells dated 2,300 years old. It's not getting any better. That's 14 years of practice with carbon dating. 1970, they said if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it's not entirely contradicting, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. 1971, freshly killed seal dated 1,300 years old. 1975, one part of a mammoth is 40,000 years old, another part's 26,000. It's not working. 1981, it's not working. It, ha it has never worked. 1984, living snails, carbon date 27,000 years old. <laughs> one atheist said, well, yeah, we know why that one didn't work. Okay, then how do you know any of them do work? How, if you know some of them don't work, how could you possibly prove any of the carbon dates are working? You can't. I mean, in a court of law, they'd laugh at you for bringing in carbon dating. 1992, two mammoths found side by side. One carbon dates 22,000 years old, another one carbon dates 16,000 years old. This is not an exact science, folks. 1996, up at Berkeley University, they used two advanced, two different dating techniques. They found these bones are 53,000 to 27,000. That's a 96% error. <laughs> this is not science. This is fairy tale stuff. It gets worse with potassium argon dating. You need video seven. For that one. <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was pretty entertaining. These um, these narratives were given about geological dating and how old things are. I think throw us all off track as we uh, start to look at at the world, and um, it's so boring, you know, when you when you're thinking about things that are happening in hundreds of millions of years or billions and nothing that you can ever witness. It's all just already there. And I, you know, thought that, that geology was just about the most boring thing, looking at rocks and uh, archeology span even worse, like digging in the dirt and, you know, with little brushes trying to, um, you know, uncover some, some bone. Um, it, it was not something that I was, I was interested in doing as a kid, but in the last few years, I'll tell you, geology is starting to just become so incredibly fascinating. And I'm going to be sharing some of some of the things that have been coming across lately. None of this is my own research. I'm just trying to make sense of our world and what we're, um, you know, what we're told and what might really be the truth and uh, how can we know. And uh, so, like, for example, you know, I mean, you hear about crystals growing, but I don't think people really get get it that crystals grow incredibly quickly. And uh, I might 
forget to go back and forth between full screen and and uh, and me. But uh, so this is just. Uh, uh, and, and by the way, I'll, I'll have I'll have links to all of these videos that I'm going to be showing and, and the resources in the show notes after the show. I didn't have a time to get them all in there before. So if you're curious about any of these videos, um, don't worry, I'll, I'll put links to them. And uh, I mean, take a look at this. They're just starting with different trace minerals and making minerals is fascinating. It's been known for a long time. Uh, Cami, who I saw in the chat earlier, she was uh, sending me some videos several months ago on on the subject, and it's just amazing what can be done. So these these people here are growing opals, which is just absolutely fascinating to me. So you know, I've always been just totally enamored of of these these. Uh, by what is it by refraction by refrescent I can't remember I've forgotten the word now Cammy and I were talking about earlier today but these different kinds of stones that that capture the light like like I always have this on me my mom made this if you can see it there we go that is labradorite which is uh, another one of these these gemstones that that catches the light from all kinds of different angles and it glitters as it moves and and it's just you know they're so wonderful to look at tiger eye is another one and um you know they didn't even know it but they they grow these things they've got there's naturally occurring ones which we'll get into in a moment but they're also they're also growing these in laboratories this looks like i think it's called thunder eggs a bit it's this reminiscent of it all these different lines going through it and you can see just how many different uh, kinds of, of color they, they can take on. So this was in the thumbnail, obviously, of the video. And this, this is something I just learned a couple weeks ago and my brain just went, you know, that, that um, opal comes from tree, right? Naturally occurring opal. Now they say it comes from other places as well, but tree is a definite, as you can see in, in these photographs. And um, I think some of the other places that they say that it's coming from are the great trees, because it's not immediately apparent unless you have the eyes to see that that uh, the sites that they're in when they're gathering these things are probably um, either the root structures or just part of the, the great trees. And if you're new to the channel, you haven't seen any of my videos before, I've got a video called The Great Trees Were Real. Um, and it's a two hour live stream where I go through a lot of the evidence that's been primarily brought forth by a guy named Mike, who's, um, got a channel called hangman one, one, two, eight. And if you haven't been to that channel and seen his work, I highly recommend you do because it will change the way you see our reality. Um, he's got just undeniable evidence. Now, some, some of you may be familiar with the whole idea of the, a lot of the mesas around the world or places like Devil's Tower, that there's some who believe that those are tree stumps. And that opens up a whole other uh, set of questions. If they are tree stumps, then why are they flat on top? That means somebody must have cut them down. If so, who, how, what kind of technology? Was it something biblical? Was it something supernatural or magical? Hangman stuff goes way beyond all of those suppositions and shows you, well, you, you saw it, the first five minutes, six minutes of this video are, are the evidence. And, and to me, it's self-evident and, and you can, you can just, you know, deny it if you like and come up with all kinds of explanations about how things died and layered down over hundreds of millions of years to create those incredibly complex structures with micrograin, with all the sap and which is now turned to varying types of quartz riddled all throughout it and looking extremely organic and looking identical to trees, both in their petrified state and their non-petrified state as they're breaking down, exactly as we see them all around our realm. So um, it's um, to me just absolutely amazing that this is, the, this is undeniable proof. Uh, opals come from trees. And I'm going to show you something in a little bit that'll blow your mind. Um, so 
this is a this is a synthetic opal and they go through all the steps in this video i'm not going to spend a lot of time on the video itself but they've um what they're showing is like it's very interesting if you look at the molecular structure under an electron microscope you see all these little balls and and then you'll see um these layers and and it's like when you when you look at wood under a microscope it's identical and these layers are not absolutely perfect like like when you see a you know a crystal it's it's different from wood wood is far more porous and so there will be lots of these little balls will be missing well that's as the light is hitting it that's what's giving it this shimmering look and catching all the different light all the different elements that are making up the 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 tree are you know reflecting different parts of the light spectrum back to us and and as the thing is moving it's catching these little nooks and crannies within the molecular matrix that is the that is the wood uh or in this case the the opal and um so these guys are just going through their recipes showing um all kinds of uh, stuff about how they how they're making these these opals um just truly truly fascinating and um I'll be using that word a lot today, probably. And you can see just the richness of color. And then this has something to do with it also. I can't remember now. The It's actually a reverse matrix. Um, so if you, if you take all of those balls that we saw before on the electron microscope and you remove those, then this is what you get is this space between. And that also has, uh, has an impact on the whole, the whole phenomenon. So this is... This is them, you know, working and, and making these these opals. Uh, I saw this a while back, and I don't remember exactly how long this takes, but not very long. And then when they're done, they they've got these at the bottom there. So they take this out, and then they can cut it into different um, different shapes as needed. So these are all artificial opals. So you've seen the wood just from a regular sized tree. And now I'm going to show you where they harvest the, the native opals, which is, you know, they're indigenous. So this is definitely uh, interesting to check out. If you're somebody who likes opals like I do, I highly recommend it. Um, and let's see, we will get, we'll get to the next part in a second. I just want to, I, I want to uh, show that. So Hangman uh, theorizes that pretty much everything in existence originally came from the trees. And I think, I think he's right about that. I think the trees can make anything, but I think also that, that um, bodies can make anything as well. And there's so much evidence for giants existing um, and all kinds of different giant beings. And so... As those petrify, you've got a myriad of different kinds of substances inside the body that, that can petrify into, you name it. So I think both, both small bodies like ours, giants, titans, I think they all existed, the titanic trees, and a lot of, if not all of the, the mining industry around the world is actually mining these things. And, um, had a lot of conversations with Ben from Waking Up with Analog, also known as the Archivist now. now. Um, I'm going to show a little clip from him in a, in a moment. But um, the one of the people, there were a few people who got me on these subjects about five years ago, and one of them was Wakey Wakey. Uh, his channel was taken down, but it's still on Odyssey. And he came out with this uh, Cosmology Advanced Geology Revived documentary. And he was showing... Um, there we go. Forgot. Forgot I was on big screen. He was showing uh, all kinds of things, like how um, at Mount St. Helens that slurry flows when when the eruption occurred. Uh, slurry flows happened in a matter of hours that that led to sedimentary layering that they would normally have told us took tens of thousands or millions of years to to form. Uh, and that was a, a mainstream geologist who was reporting on that. So it's it's pretty interesting stuff that doesn't quite trickle into the 
the uh, mainstream mindset when it comes to things geological. But one of the things that he showed in this um, video that I thought was so, absolutely fascinating got? was um, this this um, concept of coalification. And um, so this is pretty lousy copy of the video. But there are these massive seams of coal that are literally hundreds of feet thick that exist in this Powder River Basin. And I believe that this was part of one massive, massive tree. Because it is just fact that, that when you um, use a little bit of salt water, like say the great floods, <laughs> and heat, uh, and pressure, that it turns wood to coal. And uh, so this is uh, a video to definitely check out if you haven't seen it. It was a, a real important video for me when it came to um, starting to look differently at the, the mainstream narrative. And it features this, this father-son team here from, I don't know, the 70s or the 80s. And, this experiment. Uh, they're doing this experiment where they nice take music. a little, oh, a little, um, just a little, cylinder of wood and they slide it into this this tube they cap it and they put it into um, into a, a relatively mild heat for just a couple of weeks and uh, and when they As take we it can out see this wood is now darker in color it's also softer a chemical reaction between the steam and the wood under pressure has caused these changes to occur this specimen isn't coal yet but clearly the process of coalification has begun. Successful formula combined lignin and clay with heat, about 150 degrees Celsius, in the absence of oxygen. Over a period of about eight months, artificial coal was produced. So there is evidence supporting rapid coal formation. Coal is better explained by a rapid deposition and burial of billions of tons of vegetation by a massive flood or cataclysm a few thousand years ago. Right, and they also tell us that diamonds took thousands of degrees of pressure for thousands or millions of years to form, and that's also not the case. So, um, yeah, so check out Wakey Wakey's video if you've got the time. That's, that's definitely worth a watch. Um, and here we go. Presto, live science. Instant petrified wood created in a laboratory. And um, these guys at the Pacific Northwest National Labor Laboratory, they created under laboratory conditions the conversion of wood into a ceramic, the very process of petrification. The lab process is pretty much the same as petrification in nature, where products are even denser. Organic components are self-degrading due to the long-time process. Um, and then for their experiment, they used pine and poplar boards from a local lumber store, cutting the wood into small cubic samples. Once the samples were cleaned and cut, they were soaked in hydrochloric acid for two days and then soaked in a silica solution for another two days. After the wood had been air dried, the pieces were placed in a furnace filled with argon gas and steadily heated to 1400 degrees Celsius, where the samples baked for two hours. So only two hours at 1400 degrees celsius now where where can we get those kinds of heat volcanoes right you've, you've got pyroclastic flows that can be as as hot as 1500 degrees celsius um so finding that kind of heat in a time when there's great cataclysm in the world plus the flooding plus some volcanoes spew acid there, there's you know all of the ingredients are there to um to petrify wood uh, in nature and they tell us that it takes these incredible amounts of time and yet they were able to do it in a laboratory in two hours <laughs> so I think that's pretty pretty fascinating bit of uh, uh, revelation revealing information so let's just listen to a little bit of, of uh, what Ben has to say he, he's been f sending me all kinds of, of fantastic uh, newspaper clippings He's got uh, a YouTube channel now called The Archivist. I'll, I'll link it later. 
Um, he's also on, on Twitter and he's got all of, I think there's probably about 10,000 different articles that he's clipped from the turn of the century, like the early 1900s and, and the late 1800s. And so many of these articles just sound like total fantasy in our world because of the, the paradigm that we've grown up in. But when you start to see them as a conglomerate, it just makes so much sense. And it all dovetails with all of these ancient narratives that have to do with mythology and what I believe is our true history. And uh, Ben has such a comprehensive perspective on what, what I consider to be the big picture and, you know, or, or a... Uh, unified realm theory and uh, listen to what he has to say here it's new mexico but it, it's important because we'll touch on a little bit of stuff like this as we get more into the arizona arizona articles and uh, um, people today it's easy to get um, caught up on the aboriginals and the, the native americans and and the lore of these things and the atrocities that happened here which many many things did horrible things did but you have to understand that buried 50, 100, 200 feet below the ground, there were some of the most civilized and advanced races anywhere on the continent here in the American Southwest, long, long before the Indians, uh, the so-called Indians, I hate using that name, aboriginals, whatever you prefer, it doesn't really matter. But um, yeah, so we're just civilization built on civilization, built on civilization. What happened to the fossilized trees? They were harvested by mining companies. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they were full of quartz and opals and um, silver and gold. And when a tree crystallizes, depending on the um, air outside, depending on the voltage it was hit with, and again, these things are petrified instantly. These, Some of them, Jen, thank you so much. Some of these trees were covered in mud and buried under hills and covered in seawater and, you know, obvious distinctive um, cataclysmic events. But there is a petrified forest that was standing in Arizona that hadn't been touched by anything but some kind of electrical event. All the trees were standing in their place completely upright with all their tiny little limbs all petrified. And the mining companies cut them all down. Like I said, they were full of exotic minerals exotic i mean all all rubies and all you can imagine the entire uh, precious uh, gem and and uh, metals can be found in one tree one petrified tree can contain almost every precious metal it's absolutely insane what happens to organic life when it's exposed to high voltage so yeah let's hop over here we're going to jump into this one. This one's kind of a long read. Um, yeah, so I highly recommend checking out uh, Ben's channel if you haven't, uh, The Archivist. Anomalous America, he's up to, I think, episode eight right now, and they are phenomenal. Uh, wonderful to listen to. They're, you don't even have to uh, have the screen on, um, but, um, you know, he, he's just uh, revealing incredible things about North America and all of the states and what the real history was and the real geology. And uh, so I hope to do a live stream with him sometime in the, in the near future, specifically on the subject of petrification, because there's so much to cover. And what I didn't, I, what I didn't realize when I started to get into this, because I, I saw videos by um, J Dreamers called Petrified Titans and uh, his work combined with the work of uh, Mud Flood was Armageddon and Roger from Mud Fossil University. These guys talking about the idea that that a lot of what we see in the stones is actually originally biology, but not as the the mainstream uh, geological narrative would would have us believe that the, it's just all compressed bodies that have have turned into stone over time, but but rather that these are actually petrified beings of varying sizes and and what we're seeing are pieces and portions of those and so we don't we don't uh think of it because we've grown up in a completely different paradigm so all of us grows up paradigm blind to what's right around us and there's so much evidence for for what i took took to calling biogeology because i felt 
mud fossils, while it was an, an appropriate term for certain categories of things, it wasn't very good as an umbrella term, and it was misleading when it came to certain certain kinds of um, petrification, you know, like rapid petrification, things that happened as a result of perhaps volcanic events or plasma, uh, high heat, uh, electrical, all of those things can, can petrify. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Plus water, plus, uh, high, high mineral content waters, um, ash as well. If, uh, people are familiar with, uh, wise ups channel, he, he shows how a lot of stuff that very likely used to be wood is now stone, but they think that it's, you know, megalithic stuff that's been shaped and carved, but it, it probably just turned to stone and it you know if it was wood to begin with it's lost its grain along the way so people never really make the connection even though they're looking at something that looks like it was once a boat you know um so yeah so this is um you know just scratching the surface there's so much out there to um to explore when it comes to these things and uh, like i said ben has such a great um comprehensive uh understanding of it and and a great delivery as well so this is one of the many things that he sent me. From a silver mine in southern Utah, petrified wood is being taken in which chloride of silver is contained worth nearly $1,000 to the ton. Now this is like 100 years ago, so $1,000 is a lot of money 100 years ago. The formation is sandstone out of which horn silver is taken. So they're taking a silver mine from petrified wood that's sandstone... And they're getting a thousand dollars to the ton a hundred years ago. Um, the, remar the remarkable part of the foregoing is the evidence that the disposition of the silver was made subsequently to the enclosure of the wood in the sand that afterwards became the sandstone. So the wood became the sandstone. Interesting. So um, in in that little clip that I played of Ben, he was talking about massive petrified forests that were still standing like this is uh, all over Arizona, all over the U.S., but they were systematically cut down and they were harvested for their precious minerals and metals, silver, gold. Um, ben mentioned ruby. We're going to see ruby in a second. That's very interesting. Uh, so the trees are making ruby. How is that possible? Well, it, it's like one of the second or third hardest stones. You know, you got diamond and then one or two down the list is ruby. So trees are making ruby. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe what's happening is whatever substances are in particular kinds of trees, because you got to remember there's lots of different varieties of trees. Each one is going to have a different chemical composition that is, uh, you know, or molecular makeup that's going to petrify differently when it petrifies. But some of those trees are, are going to petrify and they're going to have a lot of gold, a lot of copper, a lot of silver. Some are going to have things like gemstones, rubies, opal, and, and we're going to see even more conclusive proof of opal in a moment. So, so this is probably what was all over the place, post-cataclysm, post-whatever, you know, you know the, the biblical flood of Noah or plasma apocalypse or whatever. Um, so... Um, yeah, so a forest of logs petrified into copper found in New Mexico in Jefferson County. So these logs were 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 copper. Mr. Duffin of Tokerville on on Rio Virgin, Utah has has petrified logs on his farm that are from three to five feet in diameter, which assay fifteen thousand dollars silver to the ton. That is a monumental amount of uh, of money. Per ton in silver coming from trees. Uh, an interesting paper concerning the fossil wood which is found in California has been read before one of the scientific societies of the state. The silicified sil sil <laughs> wood is said to be a variety of quartz. That's, that ties into um, what I've been, why I, what Hangman has been saying and, and I've been saying is that that the, the various types of sap petrify into quartz. You can see that very clearly. If you don't believe me, go back and watch the first five minutes of this video, and you'll see lots of examples that I consider to be undeniable. You have to be in cognitive dissonance to see those photographs and be like, 
No, no, I think that happened exactly the way they told us. The way they told us is a joke uh, com compared to what you're looking at there. And, and uh, I'm no expert. I'm not a geologist. Don't take my word for it. Look into it yourself. But uh, anyway, the wood was said to be uh, a variety of quartz. The wood fiber is gradually replaced by quartz. Uh, I don't know if it's being replaced or if it's, if it's um, you know, just petrified to quartz, uh, whatever was there. There are different kinds of sap. Every tree has its own makeup of sap, just like we have our own blood. Anyway, replaced by quartz, leaving the form of wood intact so much so that sections cut and placed under a microscope show the characteristic grain of the wood. This is just like with opals. You look at them under a microscope, you're going to see the, the, the micro layering that's in the wood. Um, by which uh, genre may often be determined and sometimes the species. So they can figure out what kind of species of wood it was by looking at it under the microscope, even in its petrified form. That's, that's some interesting knowledge there, right? That's where we need to go with all of this. When it comes to looking at the stones, uh, we need to be able to determine what it was outside of the BS uh, paradigm that, that we've been given. Um, in what is known as the petrified forest in Colorado, where, uh, where are stumps of trees several feet in height and some 12 or 15 feet in diameter, one stump seemed to have been fossilized while in a charred state, and from it fossil charcoal was obtained. Now I showed in another video uh, a clip from Hangman, and he's showing that the next stage when the, 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 the fossilized charred uh, tree becomes charcoal, the, the state beyond that is obsidian. It, it's got a heat enough to vitrify, and then it melts and it becomes obsidian. And you can see the obsidian in, in, in its pure state, and you can see it uh, in, in this clip that I showed. It's in the, I think it, I think it might be in the um, Great Trees Were Real video that I made. And you can see all of the grain around it. So it's still in the other portions that are not vitrified and it shows all the micro layering of the wood. Um, so let's see, many specimens, many of the specimens of wood are encrusted with layers of crystal, of crystallized chalcedony and an opalescent tint. There's your opal again. And I don't even know what chalcedony looks like. We'll look that up in a second. So beautiful that sections have been mounted and worn as jewelry. Let's see what Chalcedony looks like. This is a new one for me. All right. Yeah, I mean, look at this. This is just amazing. So this is sap, in my opinion. Um, and, and Hangman has shown, I'm going to show a clip uh, later on where he's, he's going through different kinds of sap. But this is exactly what, what tree sap looks like in both its, its fresh and its um, petrified form. So chalcedony is just another example of sap, in my opinion. Um, and where was I? Here. Um, I'm not going to read this one. I'll zoom in on it. So if you want to pause and read this for yourself, this is all about a copper deposit. Um, 1,500 Spaniards, uh, Spaniards, uh, they... I mean, they were mining this for ages. It was a massive, massive deposit of petrified trees that had uh, ore that averaged 60% copper and 30 to 40 ounces of silver to the ton. So this is a huge amount of metal that are being gathered from petrified trees. And here's another example. This is copper-bearing silica, uh, sil silicified wood from the from Java, and um, yeah, they're just showing that it's it's um, it, it's copper bearing, and uh, here's a close up picture. So this is this is basically petrified tree with copper. So all the we we've talked about copper, silver, opal, gold, iron. Uh, it, it just goes on and on. It's all coming from the trees, and um, and then I would say that a lot of the the um, the things like like this. If you look at these sites where they're harvesting, they're harvesting crystals from, they're breaking into the sides of mountains with dynamite, and then they're getting in there and it's wet and it's muddy, 
And just like I was showing you the, the crystals growing at the beginning, these are growing in there. Now, they'll probably give us ages of millions of years for this stuff. But, you know, how long did it really take? Hundreds, thousands, or just years, perhaps. Um, it's just amazing. These, these things are just sitting there in the, in the, in the mud. And uh, so now this is, this is really far out. Okay. Uh, shout out to my friend, my good friend Uhura, who was in the chat earlier. He's the one who put me on to this. This is amazing. This, these, these people are making rubies in a microwave. Rubies. We're talking like, what is ruby on the hardness scale? Ruby on Mohs hardness scale. Mm -mm -mm. Ranks nine. Diamond is a ten. So it's like the second hardest stone. Watch this. This is so cool. All right. So let's see. This is just a portion of it. So let me go to the full video. How do you do that? Oh. In it goes. Okay. Well, let me... Where's the full video? Do, do, do. There was a button for that before and I can't find it now. I don't... Ah, oh, here we go. Okay. So this guy starts out... And... Um, loading, loading. We've looked at that... Um, let me just... Check in, everything good with the chat? Everybody having a good time so far? Hey, web dev newbie. Hi, yeah, uh, he, he sent me one of the, the best videos of a, what I believe is a petrified heart that I've seen. Depends on the Mohs hardness. So, yeah, so he's he's starting with let's see, turn it sideways there. Uh, sandblasting tumbling. It's white aluminum oxide. He's mixing it with chromium oxide. So these are powdery substances, and then that, and the resulting powder is this soft green color. Right. It will make it very clear when we have ruby. So then what he's workwear. doing? My only work-related injury. Um, now, this, after two so cycles like, of the... I can't remember. I think... Oh, these are called crucibles, these things here, because sometimes they, they break. And um, he, he tries... He puts, it, he puts it inside of this, and you can see here, these are, these are just simply uh, candle votive glass that's like, you know, between a quarter and a half inch thick. And he just takes a little bit of this powder and he puts it in, and then he's got a ceramic top that he puts on, so he doesn't lock it down because it would explode. And he's he's um, you know there's there's a little bit of space there so that this this top can vibrate as the as the microwave is on. He's and, ten minute runtime. And then um, wasn't he, uh, he he tries this ordinary in a temperatures of ways. for a microwave. And um, and in the end. Skipping ahead here. Okay. What I do know is that once ah, the fiber... I just realized why my internet is so slow. I'm not plugged into fiber optic. Hold on one second. Okay, hopefully changing that didn't uh, cause the stream to fail. Everybody's still there. Let me know if it's all good. <laughs> all right, so we shouldn't get those bufferings anymore. So basically... Oh, this is ready. We'll stick it in the microwave and see what happens. Watch this. This is... Almost so forgot. I also have a little ceramic lid which I put on top of this reaction vessel to keep that plasma once again contained so it doesn't go free flying around the microwave and break stuff. Just as easily you can... 
you just put another glass on top of this to keep it covered and that should okay i just want to add also um he, notice he said plasma so uh, apparently whatever it is that that powers a microphone i mean a, a microwave is uh is is quite powerful and it generates plasma um so this is this is interesting because after seeing J Dreamer's video on the plasma apocalypse and um, petrified titans, saw work from a guy who's no longer alive named um, Brian Austin Lambert. He was talking about the MCO event. So I, I wasn't just thinking vul volcanism. I was thinking, okay, some kind of massive electromagnetic storm, some plasmatic event. Well, he's creating a plasmatic event in the microwave should work just as well. And in it goes. So that's not sped That should up. be it. All right. Only about 10 seconds. 10 seconds. All right, just with that exciting few seconds, it's ready to reveal the results. Let's take a look. Look at that. You can see rubies have been made even without me getting the UV on there, but let's uh, turn that on. Check that out. That is so <laughs> awesome. So, uh, oh, those are it... some sizable rubies. And let's see if I can get a few is... out of there. As I understand it, the, the UV also proves that those are rubies, but I might be mistaken there. But so this, if you're if you're thinking, you know, gemstone ruby, this is not cut yet. You know, if you if you know how to to, to slice along the along the uh, the lines and, and do it, might this is what Cami uh, Nodell uh, does for a living. This kind of thing, working with gemstones and and. Uh, she could go into detail about how that works, but but this is this is rubies in ten seconds in a microwave, starting with some powder. So how's that for rapid petrification through plasma? And here is our yield. Look at that. That is crazy that I could make this many rubies in 10, maybe 15 seconds in the microwave. Now, these are not the finest quality rubies by a long shot, but considering the minimal amount of effort and equipment needed to make them, this is highly impressive to me. I'm certain with a little more refinement of the methods, you could create even much larger rubies than this. I'm just not certain yet on how to go about it. There are actually quite a few rubies still left over in this seed material. I don't... Yeah, so that is making rubies in a microwave. So it starts to seem a little less far-fetched, these ideas of, you know, boiled egg theory and instant petrification. And there's so many examples of, of instant petrification, which uh, we'll get to some of them uh, in a little bit. Uh, so, you know, just going back to Opal, so... Did did one of the things I wonder is is this the petrification process, or are we talking about an era where trees looked like this? You know, I'm thinking of the the Avatar days and and when the sky was supposedly purple. Some call it the uh, the vapor canopy and and you know that that sort of a thing, um, where everything was bioluminescent and uh, you know you walk through through nature and everything was giving off its own glow. Um, I, who knows which is which, but um, I think that even if this is a result of, you know, that the opalization came about through petrification, I still think that that just like we have beings underwater that, that give off this kind of light now, I think that there was a time when, when there was probably a lot of vegetation that, that uh, did the same and, and what a world it must have been. Someone asks, is it safe to eat food from the microwave? I don't think so. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is, this is my favorite 
uh, part of, of what I'm going to show you today. So these guys are, they hit an underground cascade of dirt filled with thousands of dollars worth of gems of dirt. This, this is what they're calling this. Okay. So they are, um, they are inside of a mine. And if you look at the walls here, um, I've sped it up a little too much. Let me go down there. Um, to me, they're inside, I don't know if it's the root structure or just a portion of a tree that they've gone into, but um, these, that was just a little preview of what they're gonna show in a moment. Um, but here, they're, they're just, they've broken a hole in this wall. And if you look closely at this wall, this is, this is wood grain. And, uh, and, and he's just shoving a metal bar up there and breaking off lots of pieces that were behind this, this thicker, this thicker band and down flows loads of opal. Yeah, let's listen to what they're saying. I think we got a pretty decent pile, eh? That came down awfully quick. But that's what happens when you're just buying an old shaft. It's all just loose dirt that's sat there for ages uh, in the bottom of, you know, I think this here is about a 20 foot shaft straight to the surface. Loose dirt that sat there for ages. Um, and it's just filled with old loose dirt that's already been dug. We need to open that back up just so that we have more airflow. It's a bit and here, old. here they're getting out the UV light. And this rock showing it. is absolutely impregnated with opal. Look at that. Oh yeah, a little bit. Just a little bit. It's just all over. Just a little bit. That actually kind of looks like something funky, like wood or something. Maybe a little bone. <laughs> Did you hear that? It looks like something kind of funky, like wood or something. Gets you scratching your head, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, wood. Look at that. There's definitely heaps more wood in here from what you guys got. <laughs> How'd the wood That's get in little... there? It was like behind this this wall. It The whole thing is wood. They They, they, they can't see it. They can't see the forest for the mine. Whatever it is, and this is all just here. Look. I, I mean, no, I'm not. I'm not bashing on these guys like at all. I think there. that's great. I don't even know what that is. Oops. Bro, this is just the one little bit here. So the other this stuff is, is all degraded. That it's breaking down to dirt, sand, you know. Looking like a good. So, oh, here, this is great because now he's walking Bro, through the mine. This is just the one little bit here. Anyway, I'll slow it down. And you can see there's there's grain all the way along, and it's on both sides. Like here, there's a, it's a white band, and the white band is the same here. So obviously they've they've dug this out, but this was all layered. Oh, what the hell is? <laughs> and then he finds he finds this little like green some frog. It looks like goop. <laughs> Hi, Froggy! I mean, look at that thing. Look at that color. It looks like it's been opalized. <laughs> what What the heck is that thing doing down there? <laughs> yeah, someone says the wood looks so wood-like. <laughs> anyway, that, uh, that was just absolutely amazing to see. And um, you can see the quality of the, the opal. I need to get you to go and, and cut these. I mean, it, look at this behind him. This is now, this has all been hacked up. Like you can see lines, you know, who knows what the tools were that they use. But if this was polished, I'll bet you it would, it would look just like really nice wood. But you don't notice it because it's all hacked up and you don't really see that there's, there's a un uniformity to it. Oh, it's a tree frog. <laughs> Perfect. He's Jay. <laughs> Where else See would you find really a tree got. frog, but inside right. of a tree? Right, back off. Let's find more opal. Yeah. So, I mean, 
How much are opals in the store? Is this like is this like diamonds where it's all kind of artificially, you know, the pricing is um, is all controlled, so they they uh, create the um, illusion of scarcity. Hey, Ben in the house, welcome, brother. I was uh, talking about you earlier. Were your ears burning? So these guys here, they're going through um, mines. Now I think these are supposed to be um lava tubes and i'm gonna i'm gonna do a whole stream on on this soon called spelunking titanic trees um but uh when you look at this stuff first of all the, like some of the people are saying that that these have been carved out through water erosion and my question is why are all the walls so rough what about all this micro layering and then when you look up you see that that the layers they kind of go outward, um, just like you would expect a tree to do. So they're in they're they're inside of I believe like the root structures of trees, and uh, this gets into a theory that I've had now for a while that the that volcanoes are burned out trees, and and depending on what the tree was, if the tree contained things like uranium and plutonium and ra radium and those sorts of things it might be that that they just keep smoldering for an eternity and every once in a while those smolders bur you know uh burble up what do you uh, percolate up and um you know and and we have to run for cover so um yeah another interesting thing to look at these i i've never looked at any of these kinds of videos until the last month or two, just like, what is going on down there? And I'll tell you what's going on down there. It looks like giant tree. And I think probably in some cases, Titan. Like if you look at, look at this, <clears throat> this is another video. Secret cave with a 1000 foot elevator. This is another trippy video. The action adventure, adventure twins, sub to them. This is but if you have claustrophobia, take a tank a tranquilizer before you uh, watch these videos, though, because, uh, hey, Lenny, good to see you. Take care. Adios. We'll, we'll talk soon. Um, Lenny is a, a great guy. I've got a couple of um, conversations with him on the channel. He's um, He's got a PhD in molecular chemistry, and uh, we've had some interesting conversations, and We've been working on some different theories related to, you know, these these things, petrification and boiled egg theory and transmutation, biological transmutation, transmutation through heat, transmutation through electricity, all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, again, I'll, I'll, I'll put the, the links in the show notes afterwards. I'll, go, I'll get to work on that right away uh, so I don't forget. And... Uh, yeah, the more I look at this, the more it all looks like, you know, sometimes it's smoothed out and sometimes it's really rough. So to, to say that it's all carved out by water doesn't make sense to me. Um, and then when you see stuff like this, it just makes a lot more sense that what you're looking at was formerly wood. Now explain to me how this happens through sedimentary layering with all of those curves and those concentric rings there is no way and then you get these little pores just like trees do you know and then the curving here that you're seeing this is obviously that's erosion right that's going to be eroded by the water the wind floods but what a magnificent piece here and what if someone's written here Going to make some tables out of that wood, so somebody sees it for what it is. Uh, word must be getting out and starting to wake up the sheep. As someone I know that I thought was lost to the Kool-Aid just dropped me a message. Oh my god, they even lied about ginormous trees. No wonder the faux controllers are in panic mode and in such a great rush for the next reset. That's a beautiful piece of lumber, right? How, how did we ever buy it? How did we ever believe... I mean, the stories that they tell about how this kind of stuff formed are so simplistic. And if you just for a moment, you know, start to think about it, it doesn't make any sense. 
And um, I think that's why stuff like archaeology and geology, you know, when you're a kid in school, a lot of times it's presented in the absolute most boring way. And meanwhile, we're fed all the space stuff from, you know, Star Trek and Star Wars. And it's like, oh, the past is the most boring thing ever. Let's focus our lives on the future because we're going to space to get off this rock because, you know, someday we're going to get hit by a rock. And, uh, you know, that's the only way to save the, the human race is, is to, uh, to, you know, point everything to space. And don't pay attention to what's going on down here, though, because um, you might start asking uncomfortable questions. So now this got me wondering about agate. You know, we're going to talk about geodes because the title is Opals, Geodes, and the Gigantic Trees. And, you know, agate, you're always seeing pieces of agate. You're not really seeing complete things. Uh, if they're complete, we call them geodes, I guess. Don't, don't quote me on that. But, um, you know, so I, I'm starting to think that this is just petrified uh, tree chunk. You know, and and uh, it makes a lot of sense when you see it. We'll we'll get into other stuff that that's related, um, but here uh, is just another one. Never before seen crystal-like matter hidden in a chunk of fossilized lightning. This is called a fulgurite. So when lightning hits different substances, it can create these these little tubes that are basically transmuted elements. So whatever it hit, like in in the case of sand that heat and plasma from the strike is going to uh, transmute the sand and vitrify it. So you're going to get a glassy-like um, substance. And uh, I'm trying to remember why I brought this one up. It was created when lightning struck a tree. So fulgurites don't just form when they strike sand. Fulgurites form when powerful lightning bolts discharge through the ground, which melts and fuses any nearby soil, sand, rock, and organic debris into a single metallic-looking lump. But not always metallic. I mean, if you look for fulgurite, usually, usually they show them tubular. Tubular, man. Tubular, dude. Cowabunga. Right? These are... This is, this is what fulgurites usually are shown as. And look at that. Starts looking a bit like, like, um, like a geode almost, except this is long and narrow. This is a classic picture of a fulgurite. So this is lightning hit the sand and then, you know, transmuted it. Yeah, I don't know if I would call it a geopolymer, but I see where you're going with that. Um, <laughs> golden layer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so anyway, moving right along. Okay, and this is something... I, actually, we'll come back to this. Uh, let's get on to part two of our presentation, shall we? So I really hate um, Instagram and TikTok and these things because of, because of what they're doing to our minds and they're getting us all addicted to, to dopamine and they're messing up the kids and... People don't even know how to communicate er anymore because we're just using emojis for everything. I mean, we're going... Maybe that's maybe that's how the Egyptians, you know, went by the wayside. Maybe, maybe that was the beginning of their decline when they started to go to hieroglyphics, right? Because you just had, had the little picture and people, you know, <laughs> didn't have to think anymore. They just used emojis for everything and then they forgot how to talk and communicate. Anyway, the TikTokization of um, of our reality is 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 kind of a sad thing, but I have to say I've learned so many things because you get these little encapsulations of stuff. So I've actually gotten a lot of great stuff to bring to those of you who actually like longer format content. <laughs> uh, and this was amazing. This is guy. This is a guy who's um, sliced into pipes in cities. And there's no sound. Hold on. Pipes and form this in 80 years. Here's a spark plug in stone. No more than 20 to 40 years to form this. This little guy right here was put into a mineral springs in Karlavi Vary. And in... That's like um, Mother Shipton's Cave in the UK. The same thing. People come 
and they hang ropes and uh, they, they uh, hang different objects and then they come back just a few months later and they're completely, uh, you know, mineralized on the outside. Now, I've never seen anyone slice through one of these objects that's been there for a longer period of time. So the question is, does that mineral work its way all the way in and completely solidify? Or would you see soft in the middle and hard on the outside? Uh, I would guess that it, it hardens all the way through, taking a look at those pipes. Let's start it from the beginning and, and, uh, and we'll see that again. I'm about to show you five different examples of rock forming quickly. Then I'm going to ask you a question about a dinosaur bone I'm going to show at the end. From Karlavi Vary in the Czech Republic, mineralized water went through these pipes and formed this in 80 years. Here's a spark plug in stone, no more than 20 to 40 years to form this. This little guy I right here again, was I? put into Sorry, a mineral folks. springs in Karlavi Vary. just realized. And in with it. All right. Rookie move. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, let's see. How far back did I make that mistake? That's the question. What was I showing you? Uh, 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 we can only see me. Were you, let's just go back. Were, were you seeing this before? Uh, this is the electric, um, the electric uh, wood. Had you already seen that, or was it... I, I wasn't even showing myself then, probably. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's, let's, let's start over, and I, I'm going to be very careful with that feature of, of my big face. Um, so, let's just start again, because I really want you to see this. Oh, good, only 30 seconds. Okay, great. And why does it always go to mute? or bone I'm going to show at the end. From Karlavi Vary in the Czech Republic, mineralized water went through these pipes and formed this in 80 years. Here's a spark plug in stone, no more than 20 to 40 years to form this. This little guy right here was put into a mineral springs in Karlavi Vary, and in within just six weeks it turned to stone. And this right here this is the same material you find in stalactites and stalagmites in those caves that they say are millions of years old. This right here took six months to form. Here's the question. Here's a dinosaur vertebrae. If these right here can form in that length of time, anywhere between weeks to months to years, how long does it take to fossilize a dinosaur bone? If the creationists are right, then it's 4,500 years, no older. What do you think? Hmm. Very good question. And a better question is, do dinosaurs even exist? There's another rabbit hole to look into, right? Okay, so, um, I don't doubt the existence of dragons, but I, uh, I've yet to see conclusive evidence of dinosaurs. Um, so this is Hangman1128 showing... Uh, different kinds of sap and I'm just gonna let this run for a moment and you can hear him and uh, I'm gonna use the little boys room here. And it did this, okay? This is this is the natural forming thing from different plants, tr trees, shrubs, bushes of vegetation. Okay, and I'm gonna show you that here in a minute. But I want you to look at this again before we leave from here. This here was one, was no different than this. It was just a big ball of sap that it crystallized and petrified. So I'm going to cut uh, I'm going to cut this up here right in front of you. Hold on. Uh, actually, that's kind of soft, so uh let me see here. See it if I could get a microscope and zoom in on this, I know you see all these bumps and stuff of the uh this is all just quartz. You would see the same thing in this if I was able to really zoom in on it. But it's a small version. So anyway, you break, oops, you break this open. Okay, now I broke this open and let me spin this around. You'll see this is sap from a regular modern day cedar tree. And you'll see it's the same exact thing. Okay, let me zoom in a little bit. You see that? And then I just cut this in half in front of you. It's the same exact thing. Okay. This one. 
the other half. It's the same exact thing. That might be hard to believe, but I'm showing it to you. That is sap. I'm going to show you in a second. This is exactly what happens on the trees. And, and it bubbles out of the tree, and then it, it'll be hollow inside, and sometimes it's completely solid. Um, so take a look at this. In case you are doubting the possibility. See the nodule? That's all sap. And now as he pulls it off, it starts to get squished. So... There you go, right? There's, there's at least one absolutely 100% clear case of where geodes can come from. Because look at these these little balls. So this is just one tree. So if that tree petrifies, what's going to happen to those? They're going to turn to stone and then they're going to break off and then they're going to they're going to be what we call geodes. So um, again, so much of what I've learned I, I've learned from from Hangman and uh, his channel is absolutely awesome. Can't um, recommend it enough. And hopefully he's going to be um, finishing up his uh, house soon because he had a house fire and had to start over. Um, and um, so he's, yeah, he's had a lot of tribulations here. This, this is an amazing video. Yes, check this out. So for those of you who might be doubting that, that in the very beginning of this video that that is, uh, that is really petrified wood, it, he's got it in, in the varying stages of petrification. So you've got, you've got this massive structure that might be 50 or 100 feet wide, and then some of it is, is like oxidized and clearly stone. Some of it still has all the color of wood. And then he's actually, you know, on, on several occasions gone on and oh, pulled off here. pieces. And, and you can see the grain, and in some cases it's, it's still soft. It's still soft inside. It's so crazy. So it hasn't petrified all the way through yet. All this. So that is what you call 100% proof, folks. You go right over here. If you see? can't see that, this you're in denial. Stuff. This is what we see. Tell me that isn't wood, you know, and he's not showing Gosh, the camera good. with the, the main structure itself. But, you know, if we if we go to the mainstream and we say um, largest petrified tree in the world. How big was it? How big is it? Largest tree stump in the world. So when they're they're talking length here and they're saying 230 a length of 21 meters 70 feet they're saying this is the largest petrified tree in the world and that's just bs <laughs> because this is all petrified wood and these are just tiny 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 little chunks of something that was probably miles wide at the base um over here So these little trees here, they're like the macro or the uh, the fractal part of the micro tree. version. And okay, this is this is the point here is is he's saying this is part of the source tree. So all of these massive blocks that are like that are you know um, fifty hundred feet wide, like this one you see off in the distance here, these would have been like little tiny pieces like this inside of a tree the size of what we have today. That's, that's what we're talking about. And this would have been the outer ring of a, de, a decomposing tree stump. Because he's, he's coming for, at it from a biblical perspective. And, uh, you know, the what is it? The angels went to work at the trees. And, um, and then the trees laid 
for a long time before the biblical flood came. So they were in all kinds of different varying stages of decomposition. So it's that's why it's really hard to get your head around this, because it's not just petrified tree, it's petrified decomposing tree also. Um, so hangman 1128 don't miss it um, but all this as watch, far as the, you know as if, far, you, as if far, you doubt this far back as the eye can see if you doubt is, this this is all petrified wood if you doubt it watch for some hours and um and you'll realize that it just is true which is absolutely wonderful so now we're getting into the whole concept of geodes and what is a geode um and, uh, oh, wow. Look at that. And that That's... was kind of anticlimactic because it wasn't at the very beginning. But um, so keep in mind the, the sap that I just showed you. And here's a little nodule. And boom. Isn't it interesting? A whole bunch of water came out of it also. Right. So that's like holding water in. Um, I don't have it handy, but Ben Ben found an article that was talking about petrified coconuts. <laughs> So think about geodes. We're going to look at them in a second here. Um, and well, these are these are little. This is oh, my screen's about to turn off. There we go. This this gentleman is out in the middle of of the wilderness here. And it's all plateaus. So when I see this now, I I'm I'm like. I'm of two minds. I'm I'm like, are these just like exposed root structure, or you know, what has formed this? Is it is it the flood has come through, and then you have different layers that have that have then later petrified, and and you know that's what we're seeing. Um, but but this is really fascinating that um, he's he's going up to um, to basically harvest these. Um, deposits of rhyolite so these benches over here on brown's bench to the west all those layers over there are layer upon layer of rhyolites and a lot of this rhyolite was actually emplaced as pyroclastic flows so big explosive eruptions from the yellowstone volcano but when it was in the twin falls area or a little bit west of here near bruno jarbage there was big eruptive centers eight to ten million years ago having explosive eruptions of silica rich ash that inundated the landscape uh, and that sort of sets the stage for these geodes is so there's uh, the there's the mainstream uh, the geodes we're going to see here narrative are... and um the source of silica so when you see these things if we look right over the fence here this is a blm site but there are some little hills you can see some all of this, I believe, is just little tiny pieces of petrified tree. Haven't, uh, but what you can see here is that the geodes are kind of lined with this concentric band of kind of white to creamy, somewhat translucent. Uh, this is exactly what the sap does when it petrifies. And, um, and here is what, when he's getting them out of the ground. Sweep away a little bit of the material you'll see these rounded spherical masses embedded in the vitrophere um, if we come over a, here uh, it might be a we can that's see the same thing down. but here we can actually see these are broken open and have that white um chalcedony layer on the interior um right. let's see so a i'm not other saying all here. geodes so, are sap i i'm my my take is that all geodes are biogeology and that they are a combination of a whole bunch of different possible things and we'll get into more of that in a second but for example um you know we i, I mentioned petrified coconuts um i showed the sap and um the, you know these are uh these are all different possible scenarios i showed this in another live stream there are different trees like imagine this tree buried all of these could petrify into geodes so how many geodes would you find? You'd come across something that's just a flat part of the ground and you'd see all those little bumps and you'd be digging them up just like he is. So I don't think it's such a far-fetched idea at all. 
considering all I've already shown about petrification and opals and, you know, these old articles. Um, one of the videos that's on Hangman's channel, he theorizes that, that these um, might actually be um, the, the, what do you call these things? Like, not pine cones, but um, I can't remember. Con it's, they're, they're from the conifer trees, but I don't know what these are called. But, um, but the, they have these little lip and these rings around them. And, you know, if you're talking about really gigantic trees of the same species, then something like this isn't, isn't, um, isn't so far-fetched. They're in all different sizes. People think that they're man-made. Um, and you've got all these different variants, just like we have the exact same thing occurring with lots of different kinds of, of trees as well. So um, I think it's a fascinating idea. Um, and imagine how confusing it is. If, that's, if it's true, someone's going to come along, they're going to be like, these are pots that somebody made, and then they're going to, you know, get a PhD explaining how they were made and who did it and when and everything, when in reality it's just a chunk of biogeology. Um, so on that note, we're going to go to uh, something that, that was um, shared by another friend of mine um, named Brian, uh, also known as LearnShare. And uh, Brian shared, uh, he, he had to tell me this word so many times before it finally stuck in my brain. They're called bazaars. And it's totally bizarre what a bazaar is. Um, a bazaar, let's see if, oh, we'll, we'll come to that in a second. A bazaar is a mass often found trapped in the gastrointestinal system. So in the past, I've talked about kidney stones. I've talked about gall stones. Well, a bazaar is a intestine stone, and uh, it occurs in other locations in the body as well. But and then they have pseudo bazaars that are an indigestible object that goes down, and then the body starts surrounding it with with minerals, and then eventually it becomes larger and larger. So it can be naturally occurring like a kidney or a gallstone, or it can be a pseudo bazaar that could actually be brought about. And these things had all kinds of different. Um, of uh, importance, both mythologically, they were said to have healing properties. And um, so they're also known as enteroliths, uh, which is a concretion. There's that word again. So when we're looking at, at geodes uh, and concretions, we're going we're gonna to come to that in a second. Actually, let's, let's just go through some pictures here real quick from the... Okay. So I'm just going to breeze through these. Uh, agate, look at it. Look at this. How is this formed just randomly? This, this grew somehow. I don't know what it was. I don't know what the tissue was, but that didn't happen by accident. This is, um, this is obsidian. And, and someone, I think it might have been Derp in, in, in the chat, is one of the mods, was um, theorizing that maybe a lot of times when they're finding obsidian, it's also um, got oil. Um, they, they find oil deposits, uh, with the obsidian. And, um, and so if you have wood that's turned to coal and then that's turning into obsidian, then, um, you mix in a little bit of oil and you might get that, that co the coloring like you get in a puddle when oil is in a, you know, in a rain puddle, uh, makes, makes sense to me as a possible, um, as a possible scenario. And, um, I mean, it just, nature is astonishing. There are uh, a few different examples of petrified brain. This is whale brain. And, uh, I suppose someone could have faked it, but it doesn't look fake to me. And, um, the article seems pretty compelling. These are gallstones. This is a single gallbladder. Look at all those stones and look at all the different shapes, but they're all already smooth and rounded. Now, if we found those, and it, say it was from a giant and his gallstones were an inch or two inches in diameter, and he had hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of them, and he died and then decomposed in a river, and, and the, you know, then all of those would be deposited, and they would say, oh, these are this is river rock that was formed... Uh, over thousands of years from water erosion and bouncing around off of other rocks. These are kidney stones. 
varying sizes and look at what they look like on the inside see the the layering and the way they grow but the central portion is still crystalline just like a coconut you know as the as it absorbs the water or the milk the um the meat grows inside the coconut same thing with the with the um with you know geodes and and crystals in general so that's a single gallbladder gall surgery now this is a fascinating thing. This is a kidney, uh, and and notice it's green. And this is a rare phenomenon. Uh, and in in the Asian cultures, uh, kidneys are, are sorry jade. The jade stone is said to have all kinds of healing uh, qualities, and um, and that the the um, you know this there's certain kinds of jade that are extremely valuable and sought after because of you know. Oh, superstitious beliefs about about the jade but what if it really was kidney and what if there is some kind of value in harvesting even petrified versions of these organs and because of the original you know certain aspects of the original materials are still there they might be of value um, you know to health or or for other reasons um, so that's just an interesting thing to ponder like if you petrified this liver might it look like jade Probably. Oh, all right. So this is just something that occurred to me this week. And uh, it's totally mind-blowing. The lymphatic system of our body, which is, you know, one of the cleaning systems, each one of these little nodes is like its own, its own little fatty sac. This ties into boiled egg theory, petrified hearts, petrified kidneys, all these my, this stuff. My crazy idea is that I've been talking about now for four, four or five years. More and more evidence has come forth that I had no idea about when I started on this that is all pointing to and, you know, in confirmation of these ideas. Not saying it's a fact, but, you know, could be. The point is that just the human body alone and, you know, has 600 roughly lymph, lymph nodes. Well, what's a, what's a lymph node? Um, let's see. Let's go into it a little in a little more detail. Here's one photo. Oops. All right. So it's a little fatty sack with some stuff in it. Let me get you a better picture. Huh. That looks almost exactly like a kidney. It's a mini kidney. Here's a kidney doing our, our, um, you know, it's it's filtering our, our water system. <laughs> um, where am I? Hold on a second. Let me just make sure everything's going good. All right. So so kidneys. I have a stone that has um, it has what appears to be the renal medullas, which is this portion here. Um, so this is a kidney. It's just a it's a kidney shaped object that has blood vessels going in and out. That's what a kidney is, and the number. Buenas noches, Arcanist. If you're leaving or, or saying hello or goodbye, I'm not sure which. Um, so, so kidney is something uh, you know that I've theorized about a lot when it comes to all the stones, like on the beaches and and these you know that I'm that I believe are are petrified organs, because it, it doesn't really make sense to me that something pounding around is going to become super smooth and have this wonderful perfect indentation. And sometimes that indentation, when you look at it, it's got two little smaller indentations in the middle. So is it possible that some of these stones that we see were kidneys once, or perhaps spleens? Here you've got a disc-shaped object that might be that uh, might explain other stones that we see very commonly of other shapes. And then again, another look at a lymph node. So a lymph node looks like a tiny mini, mini kidney. Well, we've only got two kidneys, but we got 600 lymph stones, right? And if you think about this, for example, this is a petrified pine cone, Aurocaria mirabilis, mirabilis found in, uh, Saula, in Argentina. Uh, there, there were these trees that grew to be about 300 feet tall, and they had these massive pine cones that all got buried uh, in a volcanic flow and petrified. And um, so there's another potential source of geodes, different kinds of p 
pine cones um, that, uh, you know, conifers that, that, that could petrify and give us these structures. So again, going back to this theory, 600 lymph, lymph nodes, if they're in fatty sacs, just like the other bigger organs, then they might also be hardening during some kind of a cataclysmic petrification process. And how many stones are you going to get from the body there? Imagine this person's got a gallbladder filled with stones. You got the kidney filled with, uh, you got the kidneys, you got the, the bigger organs. You've got maybe some intestinal bazores. Um, you know, you could get a lot of stones from a single body and it's not so far fetched at all now, I, I think. So that's bazores, um, which are enteroliths. That gets back to the whole concept of concretions and what are those. But first, I'll show you this. Check this out. Now, it's not just humans, right? It's all different sizes of animals. And if you go to the beach and, and it's a stony, rocky beach, you're going to have all kinds of disc-shaped, kidney-shaped, heart-shaped, and just spherical-shaped stones. Lots of them, all smooth. Well, maybe that's because we're looking at Stones. Nope, that was supposed to go full screen. Ah. Come back. There we go. Right there. Oh, it's not going to let me do it. Do it like this. There we go. Or crap. And this is actual crap. <laughs> These are gut pearls from a horse gut pearls also known as poo pearls <laughs> or intestinal stones so a horse ate something that it didn't like didn't its body didn't agree with it. right so uh, you get the idea and now they're gonna cut it in half oh i would love one of these things <laughs> this is this is like a laser but it's using it's using water and where do you see the inside of this thing Initial impressions, smell. A little bit of a weird smell as it's going through it. Okay. Um, pull it apart. Mm. Oh. Ta da! It's a jawbreaker, all right. Wow. It's just like a jawbreaker. Is that like a piece of metal or something in there? That, I think, is what started the whole thing. That so, first layer just... So they're like pearls in oysters, right? The These bazores and, and uh, intestinal stones. <laughs> Poo pearls. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, you know, now, now when you think about concretions and you think about titans or gigantic trees, these could be... These could be petrified fruit. We're gonna, I'm gonna get to that in a second as well. Um, there's a, there's so many different possible scenarios, and all of them are possible. Like these, this thing here. This is what I was looking for: a septarian nodule. I wanted to find a bunch of these. I couldn't remember the name of it. Septarian nodule. Look at these things. Right when now look look at what I was showing before lymph nodes very similar isn't it it doesn't look like kidney because kidneys have the renal medulla but lymph nodes look like this are these lymph nodes I have no idea they they call them they're also known as um, thunder eggs I believe is another term for them but uh, and uh, that one's interesting from the outside. I have no idea what would form this. Some might find that and think it was a brain. It doesn't look like brain to me, but I mean, the point being that, that um, I think that, uh, that mainstream narratives probably fall short. I haven't looked into this, but aren't those gorgeous? It's just amazing. Uh, septarian nodules. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so concretions, 
and the goa stone this is another type it's man-made bazaars they they cherish these things and they built very expensive uh, you know containers kind of like a faberge egg to to hold hold them i don't know why they were considered so um so amazing this is one uh, another article that um that uh ben sent me petrified sea turtles and coconuts have been found in earth mounds in southern colorado <laughs> these mounds form a vast range are 15 miles from the foot of the rocky mountains one is four miles in circumference at the base one what oh the mound a four mile circumference on a mound that's a massive mound and has a thrifty growth of trees petrified and agatized wood is beneath the surface the mounds are thought to have uh to have ages ago been islands of the sea just another example of an amazing of amazing geodes so what were these things were they inside of bodies or were they Oops, I don't want to get a strike with for the music, you know, or were they, um, you know, things that attached onto trees that were sap nodules? Were they petrified fruit is another possibility. We'll look at that in a second. So um, going back to the, the video from Hangman, you know, he was showing all this different, no, not this one, all this different um, sap. And it looks identical to um, to um, what what you're seeing if there. If it Whoops. is um, completely filled in with mineral mineral material. All right. So yeah, I mean these are all starting to make a lot more sense to me. But identifying exactly what it was to me that's probably going to require a knowledge of the chemical constitution of the original. Um, kinds of sap from all the different trees each one is going to have its own signature i'm sure um you know the the different kidney gallstones all these things and then you you're going to need to do spectrographic analysis on these and then you're also need to uh going to need to understand uh, the transmutation of elements because in the petrification process there's uh there's likely to be a change of of um elements from one thing to another and this guy looks happy <laughs> and uh i get happy when i'm looking at this stuff it's just amazing um yeah so and then just thinking about fruits cross sections of fruits all of the different you know these bumps would probably wear away and then you're going to end up with some incredible pattern um depending on how you break it open. If you break it open one, one way, you might get symmetry, and if you break it open another way, you might not. Um, so just, just to ponder the idea that, that you know, fruit could, could petrify in so many different ways as well. And uh, this whole idea that, no, no, none of this stuff could ever petrify because it would have been eaten by worms and, and animals and bacteria and all this stuff long before it could ever turn to stone i don't think so i think rapid petrification is is definitely a thing i mean if you were here earlier i played a video of a guy making a ruby in 10 seconds from powder so you know look at this thing <laughs> what was that originally i don't know uh i i just thought this was cool and i wanted people to see it if you haven't seen it before i always wondered how they made these these perfectly round uh, objects. So they get them like that, and then they have these spinning cups with, with teeth, and it just polishes them. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> never, I, I never could figure out how they could make them perfect. They get three spinning cylinders grinding at the same time, and it makes it into a perfectly round stone. It's so wild. Simple stuff. And this is, you know, getting into all these different kinds of stone that when, when you shine UV light on them, they, they glow in, in magnificent ways. And um, 
This is another channel I've been following for the last month or two now. Dan Hurd. He's got a lot of subs. He goes out to crazy places and he and he finds he's like the cl the classic, you know. Um, so I'm at the very back of the attic right now. This attic. You know, one of these what, what are those guys, the prospector, the, the crazy prospector. He's 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 the modern modern version of that only maybe 50 meters long it's not very long and at the back there's some spots that are really brightly glowing i got the close up on one of them and really exciting so you can't I did... you can't see it here but this cave has got uh trace amounts of uranium throughout and i'm uh, getting that black light in you... my eyes two or three times they're yeah, really if you, badly if you get and black you know lights what? i'll probably feel and you start to play with them do not shine them in anyone's eyes because you can do some serious damage um so then they go into the back into this cave. They turn off their regular very, lights. Very very bright green. I'm hoping to find they, some they that brought a, goes... They brought a Geiger counter as well, so that um, you know they don't end up uh, being too close for too long to something that might be really radioactive. It, can, but this you know, looks like kryptonite to me. That's why they have. And uh, this is making... at one point they light up the whole. Thanks. Look at this laser beam. So that. That line right there that you just saw, that's the, the highest concentration of the uranium in the whole cave. That's why it's so bright. Look at that bright laser beam. And then it gets dark for a little bit. Not much coming off here. It's just phenomenal. Our world is so much more amazing than, than we were ever led to believe. You know, and and clearly, if um, if it's the trees that are making the uranium and the silver and the gold, you know, it's it's pretty obvious that if you can fool everyone into thinking that it came about in a completely different way, you know, it's all geopolymers, mate. Then, um, yeah, then you. Um, you know, you've got a, you've got an advantage over everyone that that is believing something that isn't true. You're going to be able to find all that stuff way quicker than they would, and you're going to stake your claim, and you're going to have the corner on the market. And I think that's exactly what's been going on for a long, long time. Hey, conspiracy music guru in the chat. Hola. Hey, brother. Mike, 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 my friend 13th Monkey, part of the Mike Tinuum. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, I want someone to look at me the the same way this hippie chick looks at her avocado. I thought that was hilarious. Hippie chick. She's not in the chat, though. She's a great mod. Yeah, so septenarian nodules. That was a new one for me. I just learned that tonight. Um, let's go back and just cover the final final stuff, and then I'll, I'll take some questions if anyone has any. Not that I have the answers. So this is, this is the fractal pattern that's formed by electricity that we see all over our realm when you're looking with, with um, Google Earth. And I think it's a pretty good indication that that shit got hit once upon a time, big time. Makes a lot more sense to me that, you know, some of what our, our fractal river bottoms came about in this fashion uh, rather than tiny, tiny rivulets of water carving out as, you know, and, and creating these incredibly perfect uh, structures it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, Oh, this is one I, I I've talked about in the past that I that I need to kind of um, um, eat some crow on because I was assuming that this was biogeology. Uh, they 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 carve these things and then they make these incredibly beautiful stones, the same way I was showing before, polishing them up. And aren't they amazing? <laughs> um, so look at this here. I, I, I'm like, where in the heck did they get this from? You know, it's like, I want to go there because that's probably a Titan. And we're looking at Titan flesh. It's, it's muscle or it's, 
it's something who knows what and apparently um and i and i still don't know this to be fact but i saw enough comments on it that i suspected it's probably true these are basically from slag uh where they're they're melting glass and um and then they get these big chunks and then they break them up so i think these are all man-made actually uh sad to say it uh it looked pretty it looked pretty biogeological but um I mean, when you see it, it looks like <laughs> it looks like flesh, and it's just so cool the way they do this. And it just breaks with just the slightest tap of a hammer, just like glass would. Yeah, so I don't think that's biogeology, other than other than the idea that that. They're starting with sand, probably, and sand came from trees, so ultimately it might be coming from trees. So this gets into vitrification and how things transmute with heat. Um, so we can look at the solar death ray. This is what's known, as, neck. It's what's known as a Fresnel's lens, I believe. I might be saying the word wrong. So he, he just uses, a. it's like what they use on these big screen TVs, mounts it in a picture frame. It, it's like a gigantic magnifying glass that, that focuses the light of the sun to the point where within seconds it can start to melt stone. This particular stone, it just broke. But this is, this is melting in real time. He's moving it around, and as soon as it, the light you know, focuses, it's just immediately melting. I don't believe that sped up at all. And you can see that it vitrifies, so... Those of, those of you out there who, who are thinking that a lot of the mountains are melted buildings, I do believe that there's some mountains that are eroded buildings, but if it's, if it's melted, there has to be vitrification. And, and there's, there's examples of vitrification, which, um, let's see if I can find them quick here. Um, Do, do, do. Where did I put those? No, it's under trees. Oh, it's under petrified. Oh, I remember. It's under melted. That would make sense, wouldn't it? So these are examples of gigantic... Fresnel's lenses. If his if this guy is is melting stone in seconds with something this size, what would that do? Or that? Or this? And is this so far fetched? <laughs> you have a a, a, a curved magnifying glass just getting the sunlight reflecting it back and setting setting boats on fire <laughs> i think that's pretty far out so cappadocia a lot of people are saying melted buildings and again you got to get up in close and and see do you do you find signs of vitrification uh because if there's no vitrification what you're looking at is erosion and then maybe originally it was wood that petrified and then the question is did they carve the dwellings before when it was still wood or after and i think in the case of sandstone dwellings it could have been after but i think it's more likely that this we're back looking at the post avatar world um and uh and the um you know the stuff was carved when it was still soft that's my my guess and this is a whole other topic of conversation. We'll get into that in another stream. So yeah, Fresnel's lenses, interesting stuff. Petrification, more on the slag and more on the electrification. This is, um, this is bizarre. An overhead power line collapsed and laid live in the field. This part of the cable landed on rocks and turned the rock into magma. Magma is molten and semi-molten rock mixture found under the surface of the earth. So it's a mini volcano that was created by a, a power line. And uh, in, in my Petrified Titans and Organs 
part one or part two video, I can't remember which, those are little synopses of my own research, um, shorter videos. The first one I think is 25 minutes and it's just showing the discoveries of uh, related to the what I call petrified organs and the work on Montgo, the, the mountain uh, here in Spain, which I believe is a petrified titan. Um, the, the, um, in, in one of those videos, I've got a, a clip from Mungo Jup from, um, from Thunderbolt's project. His video is called Instant Petrification. It's a really great video. I learned a lot from it. Uh, and he uh, talks about uh, an interesting case in Canada where high, high tension wires, really high voltage wires, uh, fell down and landed uh, on a row of tree stumps. So the trees had already been cut down and then the cable laid on the, the stumps for something like six hours without shorting out. So all of that voltage was going through these tree stumps. And I haven't found evidence of this and I've looked for it, but I can't find it. Um, but the claim is that all of the stumps turned to stone within six hours, but not just the stumps, also the root structures turned to stone. So they, they, that, that's really fascinating. So take a look at this, knowing that this is, this is formed in the same fashion. There's the, there's the cable and you can see it just like melted the, the stone, the sand, everything. And there's like a molten core in there. So is this what volcanoes are? They're, they're you know, the melted trees um, that got hit with some kind of a major plasma. So here it says, um, vitrified sand, the electricity line uh, hit the sand long enough to create such immense heat that it first turned into liquid, 3000 degrees Fahrenheit, spewed liquid, Sand and rocks are great conductors of heat, trapping in the heat, spewing heat, and then liquid sand before cooling back on the ground surface. I'd really be interested to know if it cooled into glass or rock, though. Uh, sand to glass only takes roughly half that temperature. Yeah, so 3,000 degrees, uh, but, but to turn sand into glass, only, you only need about 1,500, according to that, that guy. So, it, interesting... Someone says here, makes you wonder what volcanoes actually are, or rather were. So that's a theory I've had now for going on about four years. Oh, this is totally unrelated, but if anyone knows anything about this, to me, is this photoshopped? Is this CGI? Does anyone know where this location is? Because that looks like one heck of a giant petrified gator. Um... So if anyone knows anything about that, post something in the chat. And this is just more on the melted building thing. I played this in another stream, but uh, Karen B. confronts the father of meltology, Jerry DeCamp, in this live stream and asks him where, where, the, the, um, where the, the bricks came from for all the melted buildings that are supposedly every mountain in our realm. Um, Karen B is an OG in this flat earth community as well. Yeah. Salute, <laughs> Salute. Yeah. How are y'all doing? Yeah. We doing oh, we pretty good. good. This salutes to everybody. I'm allowing more people on too. You guys go right ahead. All right. Well, um, good to see you, bro, as always. Um, I have a question for Jerry. Um, Jerry, what are the bricks made out of? Uh, where did we, where did they originally get the bricks? We probably imagined them. Who imagined them? We did. We're in our mind having a collective experience. Like in the same way you wake up from a dream in the morning, you realize you were in your mind, right? When you wake up and you go, wow. So you think crazy. all of the bricks that in, are now melted buildings in stuff. this realm that we collectively share an experience in were made up in our mind that we're having an experience yeah, right now? Like, okay. yes. Why does anybody believe a word anything this man says? Can somebody please <laughs> tell me why? Does anybody believe 
anything he where said. It doesn't make to, any sense. Don't say any no, where did it come from? This man okay. literally thinks we're all part of the imagination inside of his head. Could she give a better explanation? <laughs> Can she give a better explanation? I'll bet she could. Um, yeah, so that's the, the father of meltology. Now, I'm not saying bricks don't melt, and I'm not saying that there aren't potentially melted buildings out there. But I, I had a, a whole bunch of fantastic pictures that I was going to show of... I can't find them now. Petrifaction, maybe? Is it at the... Huh. Sorry, folks. Can't find it. I had a good couple dozen photos. Let me just try showing basically and every every time i see melted brick where it's just like dripping it's like dripping from the ceilings and it's oozing and it just you know clearly melted brick but we're talking about like the inside of massive kilns where the heat rose to a point where the bricks that made the, up the kiln themselves started to melt and um uh, yeah, I can't find the, the photos right now, so I'll just move on. Um, yeah, no, this is just, I was curious about this. This is the Naga in, uh, I think it's in Thailand, that sure looks a heck of a lot like a gigantic petrified snake. So if anyone knows about about this, um, is this, you know, carved by hand? Um, I think it's just so fascinating, the, the whole subject. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll cover that another time and that as well. Getting on to the whole topic of biogeology and what is this? This almost looks like a cellular layer, uh, but it could also be tree. This whole idea of white, white pocket. What is white pocket? Is this, is this flesh? Is this tree? Is, is, are these cells? Is it, it's really, Pretty fascinating. I lean towards tree because so much of it looks exactly like the the great cedars, this this these portions here. And if you think about what I was showing before, those all those little chunks of agate, um, you know, just tiny little mini broken petrified pieces of this would look exactly like that. And um, multitudes of crystal. This is a really fascinating article, but I'm not going to read it. I'll just scroll so that people can read it if they like. That's another great one from, from Ben, Waking Up with Analog, uh, the archivist. And that brings us to the conclusion of the presentation. So, yeah. Any, uh, any questions from the chat? Hi, everybody. Good to see you here. 130 watching. Nice to, nice to have you all along for the ride. And, um, yeah, and the chat is flying by. Nice to see you all active and talking to each other. If you have any questions specifically for me, do an at Stellium. And, um, yeah, Epic Stream. Thank you, Derp. I hope you all enjoyed it. I like to do these downloads because I, I'm not a big fan. I mean, even though repetition is the mother of knowledge, I'm not a big fan of, um, of, you know, making video after video saying the same thing over and over again. Uh, it gets boring and, um, you know, I trust that people have a memory. Um, but that said, the more we hear things, the more we remember them and the more we see them, the more we remember them. So, you know, in the case of some other channels, I can understand why their channels have grown because they put out a video every day, every other day, and they keep talking about the same stuff, but I, I don't have time for that. And I don't want to just keep doing the same thing over and over again. So if you haven't seen my other videos, I promise you that it's not just a bunch of the same thing over and over. Uh, I tend to cover different things each time I do a video. 
What do I think whale rock is? I think that it could very well be part of, a, of an even more massive Titan. Um, I've got a video on my channel. I'll pull up um, and um, it's called uh, Geology versus Biology. And um, it's by a, a, a guy that I know through 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 YouTube, um, geology versus biology. His name is Ian David Harris. And um, this video, it's only four minutes long. I'll just play it while I'm while I'm reading the chat just for the visuals. And he um, he theorizes in this in this video here, here it's starting with whale rock that what we're actually looking at is is the part of a of a of a gigantic elephant that is way beyond Mont Go's size that we're talking fractal a fractal level up um, and this would be the little tiny microscopic bumps on skin and when when it, later on there's a picture where one of those bumps is is broken off and it looks bloody inside. Um, yeah, Alex has asked if I can give him singing lessons. I'll be happy to do that, Alex. Um, but you're going to have to buy me a bottle of cognac and, um, and come to my studio. <laughs> Am I planning on expanding on the topic of concave earth? Not really. I might mention it in, in some streams. Um, the, the guy to, to go to for that is, um, what is it? Lord Stephen Christ, um, unusual guy. Uh, he's got a five and a half hour video on the subject. And then there's a 50 minute video in it called in a nutshell. Um, and he's, uh, gotten, I think a lot of the ideas from a guy named Cyrus Teed, who wrote a book about a hundred years ago called cellular cosmogony that you can find as a PDF online for free. So if you're curious about that, I would recommend going in that direction. Whether it's concave, hollow, flat, a toroid, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm pretty sure what it isn't, which is what they're trying to tell us it is and what NASA is lying to us about and SpaceX. And so, um, I'm, um, I'm a I'm an earth shape agnostic. I, I I don't know what it is. It measures flat, uh, and it's far too flat. But is it ultimately curving upward in the in the great distance? There's differences of opinion about that. Oh well, chat rolled on. Yeah, mud fossils, uh, the eye of the Sahara. I don't know if it's an actual eye or not. I've seen stuff from Thunderbolts Project that seems kind of compelling, where it looks like the result of some kind of major electrical event. Is it some kind of biology? I don't know. Concentric rings also could be indicative of tree stump, but I don't know. I, what I haven't seen is any boots on the ground Investigate investigation that, that I, I I saw one video a long time ago and it didn't really show much that was interesting of a guy that was on site. I don't know if LSC died. Um, I saw he's got a channel up and uh, I think he had a video uh, very recently. Huh? Maybe someone else has just borrowed his stuff and is re-uploading it. I don't know. That's the concave earth guy. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, uh, oh, Coronation Day. This is my last live stream covering the awesome music from from uh, my collaboration, my, my um, collaboration from a very reluctant Alex Michael. <laughs> no. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the 
the information. I hope it made sense. I hope it fit into some some bigger theories, you know, helping us move closer to unified realm theory instead of doing this and fighting all the time. Because because I'm actually I make a, I make a lot of jokes about it now, but I'm actually completely on board with the geopolymer thing. Um, I just don't think it applies to everything, and I don't think it applies to a particular thing, namely the golden layer in the UK. And I've made a video about that as well, um, which is much hated by some because um, I'm specifically touching on the work of somebody who is much loved by many. Um, but it wasn't my intention. And if you watch this video right here, this one, you will see uh, the evidence for what I believe uh, is very compelling evidence for the great trees. And um, yeah, it led to a whole schism and somebody who's not very happy with me anymore. Um, but so be it. I can't do anything about that. Um, yeah, so Coronation Day. This is really great. If you haven't seen this one, the Synchronicity Stream, that'll blow your mind, I promise you. Uh, and that was all, all new material there as well. And this is the stream that I did about the, the great trees where I go into more depth um, than I did tonight. So, um, yeah, huh. okay, wow, I didn't know that he passed away. That's sad. Hmm. All right. Geopolymer was covered brilliantly by observation, observation Deck four years ago. He included recipes for geo, geopolymers. He showed all kinds of proof in a two-part series in that video, in, in those videos, which I sent to a certain you-know-who, and he's never mentioned them. Um, so, um, yeah. I think it's important to let normies know we don't live on a globe and uh, know the extent of the lies that we're subjected to. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we we live on a spinning oblate space water pair. Doesn't make sense to me. Thank you, everybody, for joining. It was a real pleasure. Um, you know, feel free to to post some comments. They're fun to read and. Um, until next time, take care. Bye-bye.